Hi guys, in the last video, I talked about weight initialization and what not to do. And I also showed you the basic thing to do and introduced a common heuristic used and explained the intuition behind it. But in this video, I'm going to talk about the two most popular initialization scheme that exist. So the first one is called Xavier in it or Glorot in it. It's named after the first author, Xavier Glorot of this paper which came out in 2010. And the main premise of the paper is that from a forward propagation point of view, to keep information flowing, we would like that the variance of the activations of some layer will be equal to the variance of the activation of the next layer. So we basically want that the outputs are more or less the same or are spread out the same and we don't want them to calculate the same thing. So if they are calculating more or less the same thing, the variance will be much, much lower. And it means that we are losing signal along the way. So the network is not very optimal. And this is true for the activations, but similarly, we would also want from a back propagation point of view that the gradients will have the same variance. Okay, so we don't want that the variances will start to be more or less the same because this would mean that the weights are going to be more or less the same, okay? And this is what I denoted in the back propagation video as the deltas, okay? And also, if you're reading the paper, they are not explaining it well enough, but they distinct between backprop gradients and weight gradients. Even though they don't really explain the difference by reading and from my understanding, the backprop gradients are these deltas, are the derivative of the loss with regards to um, the inputs to some neurons and the weight gradients are the derivative of the loss with regards to the actual weights. Okay, so if you're following along the paper, this might help you. And so this paper focused on two activations. One is called tan H and one is called soft sign. But the derivation that they use is good for any activation function, which is symmetric around the zero. So we can assume that if its inputs are symmetric, uh, that the mean of the activation is zero, and also that has a roughly identity linear range around zero. So for example, if you look at this graph, you can see that tan h and x, so the identity function, are almost the same at about this region, right? All over here, they are almost indistinguishable. Here, they are starting to change a bit, yeah? But uh, in the middle part, they are more or less the same. So now to deal with one, we what we want is we want this. So let's start calculating the variance of the activations. Okay, so the variance of the activations, well, it's just the variance of the activations of the inputs. But if we assume that we are in this identity linear region, then the activations of the inputs are just the inputs themselves, right? Because we are more or less in the area where f of x is equal to x where tan h of x is equal to x. So this is roughly equal to this. And this is just equal to this. So the weights times the activations. We are looking at a single neuron here. But this applies, of course, to all the neurons, plus the bias term for that specific neuron. Now, the variance of the sum, because all of these values are independent, is equal to the sum of the variance, which is this. The Bs will initialize them all to zero. So the variance of B will be zero, it goes away. Now, if we initialize the weight to have some symmetric distribution around zero, for example, normal with a mean of zero or a uniform with a mean of zero, then this is true. We also said that we are assuming a symmetric activation function. So we're assuming this. So this is also equal to zero. And so we can break down each of these terms into the product of each of the terms themselves. Now, this is the general formula. And in the general formula, we will also have these two terms. But again, this is equal to zero because this is how we set the weights. And this is equal to zero because we are assuming activations that have uh, a mean around zero. So if we use the previous initialization, if you remember from the previous video, we saw that the variance of w is equal to one over three n. Yeah, If we use that w, is from uniform minus one over square root of n and one over square root of n, the variance will be one over three n. And also if we assume that the variance of the outputs are the same, we can just denote it by this, then 
continuing our derivation, we get that this is equal, well, these are all the same. So we can just write them like this. Uh, these are one over three N and we are summing up N of those where N is the number of inputs of the layer of the previous layer. Then overall we get that it's equal to this. Now notice this is not what we want. We want this to be equal to this, but here we have this third factor. So all we have to do is to correct for this. How we will do it, we will multiply by square root of three, then the variance will be scaled by the square of this, and so these terms will cancel out. So if before we had one over square root of n, now, now we will have a square root of three over square root of n, and if we calculate the variance, it indeed equal to one over n, and so we get that this is equal to this, okay? So here, instead of one over three n, we will have one over n, and we won't have this one third that uh, gets in our way. And so if you do this correction, here is a graph from the paper. In both of them, we see the histogram of activations after initialization for a neural network with five hidden layers and a ton H activations. We see that in the first layer, there's a big variance, and then it shrinks down and shrinks down and shrinks down and shrinks down, and shrinks down roughly, I guess, at around a, a factor of one third. But if you correct for this, then this is how it looks and all the activations um, have the, more or less the same variance. So this was for one, yeah, that for the activations, what we also want this for the gradients. So for two, we can similarly show using the backpropagation identities that I've shown in the backprop videos um, and the fact that the gradient uh, is more or less one, that again, assuming that we are more or less in this region where the gradient is one, then we will get that this is equal to n dash, where n dash is now the number of inputs of the next layer, not the previous layer. And this is something to notice. Uh, will it be equal to this times this times this? And if we assume again, the initialization that we had before, this initialization over here, then again, we will get one over three n dash, the n dash and n dash will cancel and we'll still get this factor of a third. And this is a graph of the back propagated gradients. So these quantities over here, you see here the roles reversed. So the last layer has large variance, but as you move further along, it shrinks by about a factor of third. So the first layer, the gradients are more or less all in the same region. And if you correct for this again, you get that the gradients of all layers have more or less the same variance. Okay, so notice that what you need to do here is exactly the same, only instead of n, you do n dash. Instead of making this proportional to the number of neurons in the last layer, you are making it proportional to the number of neurons in the next layer because the gradients are back propagated from the last layer to the first layer. So it goes from the last to the first. So we get two different schemes. One is like this with square root of n dash, and one is like this with square root of n, how do we take a compromise between them? So here we have that the variance is one over n dash. Here we have that the variance is one over n. The compromise is to take the harmonic mean between them, which is equal to this. And if we want this to be our variance, then this will be the values of the distribution. And you can verify by yourself that the variance of this is indeed equal to this. And this is for the uniform, but you can do something very similar to the normal distribution. It doesn't have to be uniform. It can also be uh, normal. The only thing is that we want that the variance will be equal to this. And these are two graphs showing their method. They So this is a sigmoid with five layers. They tried a sigmoid with four layers. It worked a bit better. This is the tan H. It worked even better. But their corrected version, which is the tan H N, I guess for normalized, worked much, much better than the regular tan H. They also used another activation, which is called the soft sign. Here in, on this specific problem, the soft sign and the corrected or normalized soft sign worked more or less the same. And they also used pre-training, which seemed to work the best, but this is outside the scope of this video. And for another problem, you can see that here, their activation worked better both for the tan H, which is the difference between the reds, and for the soft sign, which is the difference between the this pale blue, and they also use the sigmoid with the regular initialization, not this Xavier Glorot initialization, and it worked really bad. Okay, so this is one method which is very popular, 
Another method known as Kaiming or He initialization is named after Kaiming He, the first writer of this paper over here, which came out in 2015. Now, what happened between 2010 and 2015? Well, ReLU became a very popular activation function. Okay, ReLU is just the max between zero or X. It's an activation function, which is zero all the way here. And then it goes, becomes the identity function over here. In 2011, there was a paper that showed that it worked really good on deep neural networks. And according to another paper, as of 2017, it's the most popularly used activation function. But the problem with ReLU is that it's not symmetric around zero. So the derivations that we made here need some adjustment. So let's see what are these adjustments. So this paper still assumes that we have more or less an identity linear uh, relationship, even though this is only correct for half of the region of ReLU, only for this region, not for this, but okay. Now, uh, remember this was the general formula that we had. This still goes away because we are still sampling W from a mean of zero, so this will cancel. But now this won't cancel because we cannot say anymore that the mean of A is zero. A is not symmetric around zero, so its mean is going to be greater than zero. So let's develop it a bit more. We are left with this. If we take VW as a common factor, we are left with this. This is exactly equal to the expected value of A squared. Okay, so we are left with this. Now for ELU, this thing over here is equal half of the variance of the inputs. Why is that? Well, we assume W comes from some distribution where the mean is zero and it's symmetric. For example, W can be from a normal distribution. Z is equal to this. The Bs are initialized to be zero. So here we'll have a sum over the Ws. And so the Z will be distributed normal, still with a mean of zero and some variance. So it still has a mean of zero and it's still symmetric. And so now the CDF of A, which is the maximum between zero and Z, what is it? Well, if Z is less than zero, it's zero because Z cannot be here less than zero. If Z is equal to zero, it's 0 0.5. So we have an atom at Z equals zero. Uh, it's kind of discrete at Z equals zero because Z equals zero gets half of the mass. It gets 0 0.5. And then above that, if Z is greater than zero, oh, and I'm sorry, it shouldn't be plus 0 0.5 here. So it's just equal to the CDF of the Zs. Okay, and we can see it over here. In purple, we have the CDF of a normal distribution, a standard normal distribution. What happens if we just take the maximum between zero and these values? Well, all of these values will collapse into an atom here. And from here on, it will continue to be the same CDF. So in green, we have the CDF of the max between zero and the random variable that came from the normal distribution. Okay, so the PDF of A will be equal to the PDF of Z if Z is equal to zero. And if we now calculate this, well, it's equal to this by definition. We can now separate it into the discrete part, the atom at zero, but this is just nothing, plus what is left after that. After that, we said that f of a is equal to f of z and a will be equal to z. So we can just write it like this. But notice that this is an even function. This is an even function. So this whole function is even. So this is equal to half of the function over the entire real line. And this thing is equal to e of z squared, yeah, half of e of z squared. But because we said that the mean is zero, then this is equal to this. And so we proved this part over here. It's okay if you didn't understand it. If you didn't understand, it's not such a big deal. You can just take it for granted as if it was an axiom or something like that. Long story short, we have this new half factor that gets in our way now. So now if we continue with the same derivation and we again assume that the Ws were initialized from this uniform distribution uh, that had a variance of one over three N, then the variance of this is equal just to the variance of this. Uh, the Bs are zero, no variance. The variance of the sum is equal to the sum of the variance. We just saw that VW times A is equal to VW times E of A squared. And E of A squared, we just said that it's equal to this. So we are getting this instead of the individual variances. Now we assume again that all of these are equal. 
and that the variance of all of this is also equal. It's one over three n, and we are summing n of those, so we get so we're getting this thing over here. And now the n and n cancels, and we get a factor of one over six. So we have to scale everything by a square root of six, and this is what we get for a ReLU. And if you do this, you will notice that the variance is indeed two over n. And note that in this paper, they didn't care so much if it's n or n dash, because they noticed that it doesn't get worse from layer to layer. So we will have something that is called a telescoping product. If we start with the inputs to the last layer, it will be e equal to this times the variance of the inputs to the layer before the last layer. And if we'll continue developing it, we will get all of this. These things will cancel with this. These things will cancel with the one afterwards. And in the end, we will be left with this term over here. So it's just equal to the number of inputs of the first layer divided by the number of inputs of the last layer times the variance. So, so there is some change, but the change doesn't get worse uh, with the size of the neural network. It doesn't become worse and worse as you go from a layer to layer, so they just ignore it. And here is a graph where they compared uh, the two methods using ReLU activation. So both of these using ReLU activations uh, this blue line is with the Xavier, and this red line is with the Kyming, the new method. Uh, you can see that on the problem that they chose, uh, this worked better. So although this was originally devised for ReLU and another type of ReLU, which is called parametric ReLU, this initialization is also used on other activations. And this is what PyTorch is actually using by default for all of its activations as of now. But Keras, the other popular neural network uh, framework, it uses the Xavier Glorot initialization. So both of these are very popular and it's not clear which one is the winner. And again, there's also a lot of other initialization schemes. These are just the two populars. Note that PyTorch uses a gain parameter to adjust the variance of the weights. So in PyTorch in the uniform version, this is what they are doing. And for ReLU, the gain is square root of two, but for other activation, the gain is different. For example, for TanH, this is the gain. I'm not sure why that is. I tried to look for papers that maybe give some justification for this. Uh, it might be just empirically driven. They tried it and tested it, and, and they saw that between each layer, they have to scale it by this in order for the variances to be more or less the same. So they did it. This is at least one hypothesis of why they used it. So anyway, this is all for this video. I hope it gives you more intuition about the two most popular initializations that are used. One is the default for Keras, and the other is the default for PyTorch. I hope you enjoyed this video, and see you in the next one.